Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Maxwell's House is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. It's time for Maxwell's House with Ray Maxwell, episode 56 for January 22nd, 2010. Color, it's all in your mind. It's time for Maxwell's House with Ray Maxwell, the show that covers in excruciating detail every possible thing that could go wrong with flight, everything that could go right with photography, everything you wanted to know about Photoshop and color. And here he is, the polymath, Ray Maxwell. Former, uh, former Creot. Do they, what do they call members of who works? What do they call people who work for Creo? Creotes? <laughs> Creoites. Creoites. <laughs> Creo is a uh, very well known to uh, designers and, um, and color colorists, color firm. Right. They're history now. They're part of Kodak. The, Aren't we the all? Cre the Creo logo is no more. Oh. Yeah. Ray comes to us um, from uh, the Pacific, the great Pacific Northwest, where it's probably uh, pouring down rain right now. No, it's a beautiful day. Ah, oh, see, it's, it's raining beautiful. here. Yeah, it's been very mild. In fact, it's too mild. Uh -oh. The Olympic Committee is very worried about a couple of the sites don't have enough snow. <sighs> That's coming up. 2010, the Winter Olympics hit Vancouver uh, soon, right? Like That's right. March? When? February? Yeah. No, February. <gasps> uh, wow. February, I think start is, what, February 10th? 10th or I, I'm, I'm not sure how exciting but uh it's it's yeah it's happening and they're saying the forecast isn't looking right uh, -oh. uh and it's temperature and i mean uh whether they have you know we don't have a problem with precipitation in this locale the problem is temperature it's not cold enough right so anyway well, if somebody knows how to make it colder we yeah, this got is one, the snow machines a little bit out of our control isn't it <laughs> right yeah that the uh you know, blame it on global warming. What are they going to do when, uh, when there's no winter anywhere? They're going to just have to have the uh, slush Olympics. That's it. Yeah. we we'll change the events. <laughs> yeah. So what is our topic of the day, Ray? Well, I want to revisit, because last, last week I thought it was very timely that I go with the 3D given avatar and all that. I loved that, but, yeah. But I want, I want my kick at the can at CES. And oh. so I'm, gonna, I'm just going to hit a few things at CES, and then the main topic today is going to be uh, the basics of color science, and uh, I've titled it uh, Color is in Your Brain. Ooh. It's all in your mind. It's all in your mind. It's an illusion. It doesn't exist. So uh, we're going to explore that. Explore the difference between the physics of electromagnetic radiation and the perception that human beings have of color. Which is, by the way, unlike any other animal or mammal on Earth. So did you watch our uh, live CES coverage? I watched a fair bit of it. Thank you. And I, I wanted to uh, comment on, on uh, off the top of the, uh, the show here about your uh, interview with the uh, CEO of Ford. Yeah. It was reminiscent of another very, very famous meeting. I don't know whether you've heard this story, but... Apple and IBM had a meeting. I don't, and I don't remember Apple that. And the Apple people showed up in suits and ties. Because <laughs> they were competing with IBM. And IBM <laughs> showed up in jeans and sweaters. <laughs> it's like an O. Henry story gone wrong. Right. And it's exactly what happened. I wore a tie and a blazer uh, because I thought I'm meeting the CEO of Ford. I should dress up. He, th he must have heard he was meeting a podcaster because he, he, he wore a zipper turtleneck. Right. He loved giving me a hard time about that too, didn't he? Hell yeah! It was funny. It was funny. No, he was a he was a he's a heck of a guy. I really enjoyed uh, meeting him. Very uh, very enthusiastic, energetic, uh, smart, interesting guy. I thought. Yeah, exactly. And he's doing, I think, very good work for Ford. I really think that uh, we should be grateful, uh, Americans anyway, who bailed out GM. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, what's the other one? <laughs> I can't even remember. <laughs> The other, the other car company, and Chrysler. Uh, not Chrysler, and didn't bail out uh, Ford. Uh, no, thanks Ford to Alan Mulally, who made the right, all the right moves. Right. It's kind of nice every now and then that there's somebody out there making the right moves. Yeah. 
So uh, tell tell me what you thought of the CES thing. I mean, you know, the three ties right into the 3D stuff that we were talking about last week because 3D oh, yes. TVs yes. were the subject. I mean, that yeah. was it. But you, know? but, you know, there was another item at uh, CES that really excited me, but I don't think the majority of people reporting on it really understood how incredible the technology behind it was. And uh, you saw it. You actually touched it in flight. I touched it in flight. Yes. Are you talking about that weirdo helicopter? The Parrot AR drone. Yeah. Uh, it is uh, an amazing piece of technology. And again, you need to understand what's under the hood to really appreciate it. Because uh, it's not just another, you know, neat little toy. It is a neat little toy. Let's let's face it. They're talking about it may come on the market for around five hundred. Five hundred dollars, so. yeah. Yeah. So it's not going to be a cheap toy, but uh, let me go through the technology that's inside, and I think you'll have a different appreciation. They call it a, a quadrupter because it has four uh, helicopter blades, right? Counter rotating helicopter blades. But that's not what was interesting about it. Uh, no. I, I, and I think I know what you're going to say, which is it auto stabilized. Yes, and it is super auto stabilized. Let me let me point out I've got a, a model helicopter here of my own, and you'll notice it has coaxial blades, all right? Yeah. And uh, yeah. the beauty yeah. of coaxial blades is this helicopter, if you let go of all the controls, uh, coaxial blades mean it has two main rotors that rotate in opposite directions for the right. audio podcast here. Right. And uh, the uh, that design alone will cause it to be much more stable than a single rotor helicopter. Single rotor helicopter, the pilot has to stabilize it. If it starts to tilt one way, it'll just keep right on going. Mm -hmm. This type of design won't. So a helicopter that is more or less stable, uh, all you have to do is choose the correct mechanical design. But there's much more involved with the uh, with the AR drone. Um, the problem with that helicopter model behind me is that that little helicopter, um, if I take my hands off the controls, will go into a hover, right. but it won't maintain a constant altitude, and it will slowly drift in whatever direction I have it trimmed for. That was the uh, cool thing about the AR was, in fact, all of the demos, they would have it just hover there. And right. it was kind of weird. It was like, it yeah. actually felt like something out of a 3D movie because it, it didn't seem... Right. It was just there. Let me go through what's in it. First of all, uh, the helicopter model that I have here has a piezoelectric gyro that stabilizes it in the yaw direction. Okay. The uh, drone, the AR drone, has three accelerometers and three gyros. So it can sense uh, pitch and roll and yaw. Okay. And it can sense movement in any direction. So that's kind of first order stabilization. But much more important, it has an acoustic altimeter shooting out the bottom of it. So you Wait can, a minute, say that again, an acoustic altimeter. It has an acoustic, it's an ultrasonic sensor, transducer, that's sending pings out uh, of the bottom of the helicopter. So it's like sonar. Right, it has a radar altimeter if you want, only it's, it's done with ultrasonics. Wow. And so it can maintain a constant altitude. You can set it to fly at a certain altitude, and it will maintain that altitude because it's above the ground, you know, any surface that it's above. It then has two streaming video cameras, one looking ahead. And by the way, uh, you can control this thing, uh, an aside, small item. You can control this thing from your iPhone. Right and use tilting your iPhone to steer it and guide it. But it also sends back a live streaming 15 frames per second picture uh, looking out the front of it. In addition, it has a second camera looking straight down out of it. Huh. This camera runs at 60 frames per second. And you say, well, why such a high frame rate? Because it looks at the patterns below it on the ground and it stabilizes in the X, Y axis to hold that image steady. Hmm. You, you, in other words, it works like a mouse. Hmm. It's a floating mouse that knows when you move it. Wow. 
Did you realize that was happening? I didn't pay that much attention to it. I mean, now I wish I had. Because uh, <laughs> it was like, yeah, okay, fine. I've seen a few RC yeah. helicopters before. Right. And that's that's the way most people look at it. Oh, it's a cute RC helicopter. I've seen thousands of them, and right. I have. I've got one. You know, what's the big deal? Now, in addition to that, it's another cute thing. Of course, you talk to it via Wi-Fi from your iPhone. If it gets out of range or is interfered with and isn't getting the ID number from your thing, it goes into a hover at a predetermined altitude. Oh, that's cool. That's really and, cool. And, yeah, and until you walk up and get in back in range, it'll wait there for you. <laughs> and it you know, won't flip over and crash or do anything like most model helicopters will do. So now I know yeah. why it's 500 bucks. There's a lot of technology in this thing. A lot of technology. Yeah, yeah. Now, in addition, I don't know what they showed this at the show, but uh, it also lets you play augmented augmented reality games wow when you look out either of the cameras it has software i don't know whether it's on the iphone or on the in the aircraft but it can um well let me back up the truck a second the next thing you need to know is if you have two of these you can put a little colored target on top of each one and the cameras can be taught to lock in and find and lock in on the color target. So it's got image recognition Wow! for, I, for both cameras. So the thing can, uh, you know, uh, zoom zero in on the another one of these helicopters. But in the software, it makes that other helicopter appear as an animated Oh, spaceship. Oh, how funny. Whatever. So what you're seeing is, uh, is another spaceship. Right. You're not seeing this model helicopter. It's an augmented reality, <laughs> virtual reality game. That's pretty fun. <laughs> and the same thing Oh, it's is, shooting at you, too. You can see yeah. each other shoot at each other. Wow. Right. Right. And it, it's got this homing. Yeah, see those little color things on top of yeah. the things? That's what it's homing in on. And then you can fire and do all kinds of stuff. But what you see on your on your uh, iPhone, iPhone yeah, is not necessarily, you know, what's in the room with you. Of course, you need two $500 pair of yes. AR drones to play this game. <laughs> but not to mention also, an iPhone. You can also use that colored thing as a homing beacon. You can put it in the room where you want it to land or whatever, and then give that command, and it'll find it in the room and then go over and land in front of it or what That's have you. Neat. Yeah, I mean, so. this is... The, it's a very cool technology, and it's an ex yeah. expensive toy, but it's, it, I wish I had known. I would have paid a little more attention to, uh, to it. Yeah, it, it has a lot more under the hood than first glance. Yeah, it certainly attracted a lot of attention, uh, from, especially from television cameras, because it's so cool looking. Sure. You know, because sure. it's just hovering there. By the way, it's running uh, Linux OS on a 32-bit, 468 megahertz processor, uh, and it has a USB connection for future updates. Wow! So, so you know what I'm saying? It's a, it's a, it's a little AI machine. Say, look, yeah, smart computer. Right. right. Are it's, these people? It, I think these guys are French that did, did this. I think so. Yeah. I believe you're correct. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. Uh, all I'm saying is there was more than meets the eye when you, uh, uh, you know, to get that thing to hover in a stable position at a certain altitude at a certain place is non-trivial. And then, by the way, the other thing that confuses people is there you're showing pictures of it with, you can see the four rotors. Without the fairing or the, and then, the yeah, shield. And then it has a fairing for indoor right. flight or near people so that it doesn't chop your uh, head off, hurt, hurt anything <laughs> and, and or break your rotor blades, you know, right. by bumping more, That's them. more likely, frankly, that it would hurt it than it would hurt you. Right, right. So, uh, at any rate, I just wanted to... Uh, follow up Very on neat. that because when i read up on it i uh i you know i was quite excited about it yeah now let me uh go to one other thing that came up at ces that is connected with our main topic today and that is uh who was it that had the quad pixel tv with the yellow picture? sharp showed red green sharp. blue yellow okay bad terrible really, 
really bad. You're, you're, Scott Wilkinson's in agreement with you. He says that it, right. it's red, green, blue is the standard. Why would you add a fourth color? Well, because the the thing is, the encoding of the signal assumes... Well, and let me back up the truck. Video, unlike computers and digital cameras and whatnot, video assumes a standard output device. It is output right. referenced. There is, in the industry, there are... Uh, vector scopes and various instruments that check to see if your broadcast signal is correct, correctly encoded for a certain color gamut. And it assumes that all televisions produce exactly the same color gamut. And so it's an output referenced system. And all broadcasters are supposed to adjust their cameras, adjust their encoding schemes to meet this standard. And so if you bring out a new device that'll produce a bigger gamut, the only way you can do that is play with the encoding and create colors that aren't there or exaggerate colors that the broadcaster didn't intend. Right, so, right. You know. That's exactly what Scott said. You know, having an additional gamut on a monitor, if you're a photographer, that's one thing. But to create it on a broadcast standard device, there's, there's no point. Right. It's going to break the standard. Right. Because in the computer, in the high-end computer, printing, digital photography, we are finally referenced to the LAB color space, which is a model of human perception, right. which takes in the entire gamut that the human eye can see. Now, there aren't any devices that can either reproduce it or shoot it. Uh, so consequently, we have profiles, ICC profiles, that describe the different devices. And we have software that knows how to map from the color gamut of one device to the other. And uh, eventually, in one of my episodes, I'm going to talk in depth about ICC profiles. But today, I'm going to go to the underlying technology. And I've got a few other potpourri, but I think I'm going to jump into it in case we need to cut off. Um, this is going to be color is in your brain or color science 101. Good. Oh, uh, be you, it would help if you pulled up, uh, go to meeting. Okay. For that. And do we have any commercials today? We do not. You may go through without stopping. Okay. Um, because what I want to point out at the beginning is, a lot of people talk about the spectrum and how light is made up of the, you know, the spectrum uh, and uh, you can reproduce it with red, green, and blue and all that. All of that physical stuff we're talking about from a physics point of view is electromagnetic radiation. Right. So electromagnetic radiation is the kind of radiation that stimulates our eyes and makes us perceive color. But in order for color to happen, there are a minimum, a minimum of three things that have to be in place for us to see color in the world around us reflecting off of objects. I'll talk about emissive color later. That's another topic. But we have to have an illuminant. We have to have some source of, uh, of light. And we have to have... Um, and we have to have then a colorant, a dye or a pigment that absorbs part of that spectrum and reflects it into, reflects some of the incident light into our eye. So it's a three-part system. It's a three-part system. There has to be an illuminant. There has to be a colorant, something that absorbs or reflects uh, from the illuminant. And then we need our eye brain uh, in order to perceive what we call color. Keep in mind that other mammals don't have the same three kinds of cones that we do. Other, all kinds of species do not have the same kind of color vision we do. They don't respond to the same wavelengths. Some of them respond to a, a broader wavelength, such as the uh, bees. Uh, they have a fourth cone, and they uh, respond to light in the ultraviolet. They have red, green, blue, yellow? 
No, uh, no, uh, no. <laughs> <Ryan Greenfield. you've... laughs> They're the that... sharp television of uh, the uh, natural world. There you go. It's ultraviolet. Yeah, they, they have right. an extra cone down at the blue end. And uh, isn't that interesting? So they uh, and and by the way, I'm going to digress for a moment because uh, by the way, I, I'm I'm I never cease to be amazed by our audience and what they write to me about. And be sure if you have ideas, questions, or whatever to write to Ray at twit.tv. Oh yes. And uh, uh, one wrote in, pointed me at an article about the evolution uh, of how how you know scientists believe that color vision evolved. And uh, one of them is, has to do with bees. They think bees and flowers co-evolved. Oh, that makes sense. Okay, that the flowers... Because it's a symbiotic relationship, isn't it? Right. The flowers produced colors that attracted bees whose vision could easily detect bright colors amongst all the other foliage that the flowers produced. Now, which came first, the chicken or the egg? You know, I don't know. And, and again, this is not absolute sure theory, but it makes sense that uh, there could be a symbiotic relationship there between the bees and the flowers. The flowers need the bees to pollinate and spread their pollen, and the, uh, and the bees need the pollen to make their honey. Right. So if uh, if you have a you know an ancestor bee that has slightly you know due to a mutation has some ability to detect flowers amongst the other foliage, he's gonna survive better than a bee without that. And so little by little, the surviving be bees developed uh, this kind of vision uh, that it makes it easy to pick out flowers. And the flowers who had bright uh, you know, uh, foliage or stuck out uh, in the sensory uh, spectrums of the bee, they survived. So, and the same thing with uh, fruit. We think that uh, fruit, that ripe fruit, we think that uh, our ancestors could pick out ripe fruit. And again, uh, after eating it and the seeds and then depositing the leftovers <coughs> somewhere else, those seeds might get planted and, and fertilized at the same time. Yeah. At the same time. Such a deal. So again, there may have been a symbiotic relationship between the, uh, you know, the colors of fruits and, um, and species that could pick out ripe fruit. And, uh, any rate, that's at least one of the theories. So, Back to this requiring three things. If I turn off the lights, you can't see color. Right. You know, there could That's be all one kinds of, the, of color. one of the parts, yeah. Right. If if you have all kinds of colorful objects in your room and I turn off the illuminate, there's no color. Right. Et cetera. So now the next thing is let's talk a little bit about illuminants. And I have a uh, a picture of a spectrum. The part of the electromagnetic spectrum that our eyes react to runs from 400 to 700 nanometers. That's the wavelength. You can, you can measure the physics of electromagnetic radiation, the physical properties of it, um, in two ways. One, the wavelength, so we can talk about how many uh, nanometers it is. Uh, that tells us what part of the spectrum is in or the frequency it's vibrating at in electromagnetic radiation. Frequency and wavelength, of course, are inverses of each other. So we can talk about either one and know what the other one is. But the other one is how much energy is at a particular place in the spectrum. And uh, so you need a instrument, a spectrophotometer, a colorimeter, or digital camera that's what it does, is it separates by frequency. In the case of a spectrophotometer, it's usually 24 or 32 channels. So it divides that spectrum up very, very narrowly into 10 nanometer channels. Uh, whereas a colorimeter or a digital camera just has a red, green, and a blue channel. It has fairly broad channels. And it tries to mimic the three channels of human vision. But let me tell you, there is no instrument that can mimic what happens with the human eye because the human eye has a whole bunch of little characteristics. Number one, 
the human eye has three kinds of cones, but it also has rods. Now, the rods, the peak sensitivity is slightly different from the cones, and uh, it the rods only work when it's real dark outside. And I don't know if you've ever noticed, if you turn down the lights and you can still see things at night in real uh, dark situations, but there's no color. You lose your color vision in very, very dimly lit situations because cones aren't being stimulated. And uh, it also takes time for those rods to adjust. Any, any uh, astronomer will tell you that they get themselves into, uh, you know, no white light around for at least 30 minutes before they try and look through a telescope and see any faint object. Now, I'm, I'm not talking about the planets or the moon. I'm talking about very faint objects that you'd look at through a telescope. Uh, and by the way, if you look at the planets or the moon and then try and look at a dim object, you need to wait 30 minutes for your eyes to adjust. And uh, those two kinds of uh, vision are called scotopic and, and uh, oh, I just blew it. I thought I could remember this. <laughs> scotopic and ecotopic. Uh, no. Yeah, there's it. another one. At <laughs> any rate, there's two kinds of vision. One is the rods and one is the three cones. Um, next thing I wanted to explore is in that uh, spectrum, electromagnetic spectrum, we have different kinds of light sources. And they specify our light sources are ones that produce continuous spectrum in kind of a funny way. Uh, they talk about uh, degrees Kelvin for black bodies. And this is kind of weird to people. Like, for instance, a typical tungsten light bulb is about 2,800 2, degrees Kelvin. What it means is if you had a theoretical black body and you heated it to that temperature, the electromagnetic spectrum coming out of it because the electrons have been excited by the heat, they will emit photons continuously over a wide spectrum, but it'll, they'll emit more photons in the red area than they do in the green or the blue. So you have a reddish light, and uh, sunset light looks like that. Tungsten lights look like that. Uh, whereas uh, midday sunlight is more around 5,000 to 6,000 degrees Kelvin. And north skylight on a bright day is all the way up around 10 or 12,000 degrees Kelvin. Very, very blue huh. uh, with less red. That's funny because our uh, lights in here are uh, supposedly daylight, but they're 6,500. Yeah, that's, that's correct. It's like that's, mi middle daylight. Yeah, that's yeah. middle daylight. Right. Yeah. No, no, keep in mind, I said the 9 and 12,000 is northern skylight. Right. That's, but when you mix it with direct sunlight, the average is around five to six thousand. It's it's really interesting that you know you, you forget that daylight's not one color. And no. When you're in uh, Scandinavia, daylight's very different looking than when you're in uh, in equatorial Africa. But the human eye does another thing that cameras and instruments don't do. When it looks at a scene, it takes the brightest thing in the scene, and it says, "That's white." Please read all other colors relative to it. So it does a white balance, if you will. And that lightest thing can have a strong brown shade. It can have a, a, a strong bluish color to it. And the whole optical system, the brain eye thing, will adjust accordingly. And it, so it reads colors relative to the lightest thing in the scene. And uh, uh, a camera does not do that. It mm. reads electromagnetic radiation, you know, just the way it is. And, uh, you know, uh, you have to then make adjustments or you'll see the reddishness or the bluishness of the various uh, color sor uh, light sources. So you have to do that, you know, through other sensors in the camera that do a white balance or you have to use your software to do a white balance after the, uh, after the fact. Photopic. Photopic and scotopic. There it is. It's further down in my notes. I just got ahead of myself. Thanks, Rob and East Coast Girl. They got it. <laughs> Our chat room. They're brilliant. Yep. They're always there to fill in the blanks in my brain. <laughs> um, let me point out another thing that people... Well, let me go on now just a second to this famous set of curves. I'm putting up a set of curves that show the sensitivity 
of the three kinds of cones. Now, oh, color you've scientists, shown me this one before. I've seen this, this before. You've seen this one before. <laughs> Uh, but it's very, very important to understand it. Now, this is a model of the cones in the human eye when the subject is illuminated by a certain 5,000 degree Kelvin light source, when the illuminate is at a certain level. Uh, in other words, it's, it's, it's a snapshot of, of human perception in a certain standard set of lighting conditions because they, it varies with the light levels and this white adjust and all this sort of stuff. So this is a snapshot in a kind of typical condition and it shows the sensitivity. And you'll notice that the, now let me back up the truck here. We, uh, the layman refers to these cones as red, green, and blue sensitive. Right. The color scientist talks about them as the long, medium, and short wave length uh, uh, color sensitivity of the eye. And uh, what you will notice in, when you look at these diagrams is the blue is down here centered around 450 nanometers. Uh, the green is around 555 or so. The red is centered on about 610 uh, nanometers. And you'll notice that the red and green overlap heavily. In other words, the, the sensors that sense red and green uh, actually, uh, if you have, uh, both of them will react to a, uh, uh, an input, you know, anywhere from 540 all the way up to 680 nanometers, they'll both react. But as you move to the, to the, uh, longer wavelengths, the red one reacts more strongly. So the way we differentiate red and green is we compare the, the relative, uh, strength of those. Now, one in 13 men is colorblind. Mm -hmm. And usually, typically, the overwhelming colorblindness in men is red-green colorblindness. And uh, that has to do with the genetics. And by the way, you inherit that colorblindness from your mother. There's only uh, one in uh, 230 women that is colorblind, but they carry a gene on their, uh, the chromosome that makes males, that's X. Uh, have to ask Dr. Kiki. But at any rate, they pass it, the mothers pass it to their sons. And yet it usually isn't expressed in women because it's on the chromosome that makes males. Uh, but it can be passed on by the mother. So uh, the next thing you need to know is these, these uh, curves that I'm showing, the sensitivity of the human eye varies from person to person in people who aren't colorblind. The exact center of each of those is not the same. So color in the final analysis is subjective. And I used to run tests on this. When I worked for Creo, I worked on the Spectrum Proofer, which is a very high-end, very high-quality proofing device for the printing industry. And uh, the customers that used it were very, very, very fussy. But I learned very quickly in the industry that color perception varies from person to person. So when I would go into a a plant, uh, and I did the beta installs, the very first installs of this proofer, I would always go in and the first thing I would ask, I'd say, I want to, who's the guy in this plant who has the golden eyes that everybody agrees he's got the most sensitive color vision or barring uh, that you don't identify somebody as that, I want to know who's going to do the acceptance test on this and sign my check. <laughs> <laughs> so they they would all there without exception almost every print, oh yeah that's George down here man his color perception is you know bang on you know okay fine and then I had a test that I would ask him it, what it was was it 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 was a printout that had a uh, a gray surround area that used nothing but the black inks in a printing system and then I had cyan, magenta, and yellow inks that were mixed in such a way to produce gray. And there were little squares. And then I, they all had the same amount of cyan. And then I varied the yellow and the magenta. So what I'm trying to explain is that the gray produced by the cyan, magenta, yellow was not the same spectrally as the black ink gray. But I would ask them which square in this matrix matches the background gray produced by only the black ink. And it's amazing how much it varies from person to person when you run that test. 
But what I would do is ask the golden-eyed person in the company to pick out the gray square, and I would then know what their offset was from huh. what's called the that's, standard observer. That's clever. And then I would adjust their machine to suit their, their eyes. eyes. Wow. Because uh, the other time that I uh, had an incident with this, I had a, a, a good friend of mine that worked at Creo who had... I don't know, he had 25, 30 years in the commercial printing industry and uh, was a wonderful resource to me to tell me, because here I was the scientist, but there's nothing like having hands-on uh, real experience in the industry and what people, how they will react to various new sciences and ideas. And so I was in the light booth one day, a 5,000 degree Kelvin light booth, and I had this, this test sheet that I had made up to test people's vision. And... Uh, he happened to walk by and said, hey, what are you doing? And I said, oh, I'm testing out this new test pattern. And I said, which of these squares is gray? And so he picked out the gray square he thought was gray. And I said, that's interesting. Uh, that's the same square that I picked. And he said, well, you know, I said, we see eye to eye. And he said, well, what's so unusual about that? And I said, well, if I use the spectrophotometer and, and plot this in the LAB space, which is a model of the standard observer, middle of the curve, I said, you'll find that this square over here is really the one closest to this gray background. And his immediate reply was, well, the instrument's wrong. <laughs> okay. Oh, <be> darned. <laughs> and, and so I said, well, just a minute, Gordon. Gordon Pritchard was his name. Good friend of mine. Lives over in Victoria now. At any rate, uh, I said, let me, let me demonstrate something. And there were two women coming down the hall. And so I Grab these two women and say, come over. Come over here. I want you to take this test. And uh, so I had these two women pick out the gray square. And uh, they picked out a different square from the instrument and a different square that Gordon and I had picked out, one of them. And then the other one picked out yet a different square. All right. And I remember that women are much less likely to be colorblind. And some women have slightly higher color acuity. Not all, but some. Uh, My wife so does. To hear her tell it anyway. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so at any rate, when we got done with that test, and we now had woman one, woman two, the instrument, and Gordon and I, and we had four different squares. And I said, what do you make of that, Gordon? And he said, y y you mean it, it varies from person to person? I said, yeah, <laughs> it varies from person to person. <laughs> and uh, he was just floored. He said, I've had an epiphany. <laughs> you know? Color is all in your mind. It's all in your mind. It's all subjective, and it varies very slightly. But if you're trying to do real precise proofing in the printing industry, and let me tell you, the clients that were the most demanding were the printers who printed automobile brochures and trying to match the oh, paint. Oh, yeah, because, yeah, cause, sure, yeah. On an automobile. So they you're were, picking the color based on the brochure in many cases. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Those guys were super, super fussy with, uh, you know. So given this, let's go now. And we, th by the way, those curves describe, as I said, the LAB color space. They, that is what LAB is based on. Uh, it is based on this model of human perception. And L is the lightness going from 0 to 100, uh, 100 being bright white. Is that the same as luminance? Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Okay, forget I said that. Keep telling you on. <laughs> yeah. It turns out that brightness, luminance, and there's another lightness are not the same. Oh, interesting. We use them interchangeably. Yeah, but a color, yeah. A color scientist does not. They have very specific meanings. Hmm that apply to very specific things. But uh, uh, let's just say that uh, L star or the L and AB, and then the uh, A axis uh, runs from uh, magenta to green. The B axis runs from uh, blue to yellow. So so it's, you know, because, okay. Got oh, it. Go ahead. So it's brightness. Because I've, you know, I've seen there are many ways to represent color. If you look, if you go into Photoshop, right. you'll see all these different ways to do it. Right. Uh, hue, lightness, color. I don't know all these different ways of doing it. So this, but it's this is a little different because of the AB axis. Right. Yeah. 
L star. So it's like how L much how much of this, this magenta scale and how much of this other scale? Right. It, it, let me just explain. A plus A means that it's magenta. Minus A means it's green. Plus B means it's yellow. Minus B uh, means that uh, it's... Uh, uh, what am I... Minus B uh, is blue. <laughs> and this is this is a preferred way to do it because it's more like the eye, how the eye works. This is an as close as we can model. come. Remember that the eye is dynamic, right. and we can't model that. So right. this is a static model of the eye at a certain illuminant at a you know certain time. It's the best we can do, and and the math behind this is not simple. I, I started to say with simple math, it's not simple. Uh, there are appearance models that are more complex than this, uh, but they're very difficult to use in practical circumstances. There are scientists, uh, Fairchild at uh, RIT, Rochester Institute of Technology, which specializes in printing huh. and color. Uh, and, and they have developed appearance models that do more of this dynamic mapping. Because when you put colors next to each other, it changes your perception of the color. If you if you surround a uh, yellow with a dark brown, you see actually see if you're asked to match that color with a color chip, you actually match that color differently than if it's surrounded by green, let's say. Mm. Now, so it it what I'm saying is the human eye is really dynamic. Now on top of that, and uh, back when you and I were on the lab with Leo, I demonstrated this for you, and you had a bit of an epiphany. The size of a color swatch matters. If you, do you have more cones, color sensors, in your fovea? That's in the very center of your vision, where you have your sharpest vision. And you have a uh, higher number of rods in your peripheral vision. And this explains why, an, uh, again, an astronomer, when they want to look at something dim, they use what's called averted vision. You don't look right at the object you try you glance just a little to one side of it and you will see very dim objects better than if you look right at it because your cones aren't working in real dim light and there's more of those right in the center of your vision now so what they what they discovered is when they built these lab curves they found out that um that if you have a color swatch that only covers the fovea that little two degree uh, area in the center of your eye, you perceive a different color than if you have a big swatch of color that goes out to 10 degrees. So they have two models. They call it the two degree and the 10 degree. And a lot of people get confused when they see that on a spectral photometer and they think that's the viewing angle of the instrument. It's not. It's the two models of the eye. If you fill the eye with a color swatch, it sees a different color than if you have a little tiny swatch in the middle. So that's why if you take these little tiny color swatches and match them to your drapes at home, go back, buy the can of paint, paint the whole right. wall, and then you go, oh, I don't like that. It doesn't look like the color swatch. That's because it's filling all of your vision, and it actually shifts the color that you perceive. And uh, so you want big color swatches if you're going to, you know, do that. Um, the other thing I want to point out, uh, in my diagram here now, I have produced a single wavelength of light. In this case, I've drawn it at 575 nanometers, which is yellow to our eyes. So this single wavelength of light, what it does, if you look at the curves, is it, it puts an equal amount of energy in the red and green cone. So when the amount of energy coming from the red and the green cone are equal, more or less, we perceive yellow. So there's a single stimuli that can produce yellow. However, we can make the brain think the very same colors in front of it if we stimulate the red and green cones with two separate stimuli made up of red and green at two different wavelengths. So this is how color television and all color reproduction methods produce all the different colors. They just use red, green, and blue. And if we put the right amount of red, the right amount of green out, then your eye will see yellow. Keep in mind, those two stimuli physically are different. So this is called a color metric match. 
those two stimuli match in your brain. Physically, with a spectral photometer, they're not the same input. The other big word that gets misused like crazy is these are a metameric match. And we hear about metamerism. Metamerism, yeah. Metamerism is a good thing. And what people get confused at is they say, oh, that ink doesn't look the same in different light sources. It's uh, metamerism. No, that's co color constancy. They're not the same thing. But a metameric pair is a set of stimuli that in one given lighting setup cause the human brain to see the same color. That's the metameric match or metamerism. But it, it's been, you know, misused for so long now that it's hard to get it back. But if you talk to a color scientist, that, that's what he will tell you. And then finally, uh, I want to point out real quickly, and we'll wrap up and give uh, Kiki some time to set up here. Um, the last thing I want to point out is that I've shown you how you can, with a single wavelength of light, you can produce certain colors, uh, and then you can simulate them with uh, two colors. But there are colors that you can make the brain see that cannot be produced by a single wavelength of light. And if you go in here and you stimulate the red and the blue cone, these are at opposite ends of the spectrum, you will see a color we call magenta. And there is no single wavelength of light that will produce magenta. So magenta only <laughs> exists in your brain when the red and the blue cones are stimulated in your eye. I and love this. Uh, this trick that you did on the, on the lab as well. Right, right. I just love it. And there's the magenta. There's, there's, the magenta there's no patch. such color as the color you're seeing. Right. It only exists in your brain because I've turned on the red and the green phosphors on your TV or your computer monitor or whatever. But there's no single wavelength of light that can produce that sensation in your brain. This is an artificial color that's an illusion in your brain. So with that, we better give Kiki some time to get with her people and I'll wrap it up for this week. You're the greatest. What a great subject. I just, uh, I just love this. And we're gonna just uh, we're gonna get in more about photometers and spectrophotometers and colorimeters and when to use them and how to use them with your computer, your monitor, your camera, and uh, also I'm gonna do uh, some stuff on uh, this week in photography. Uh, I'm gonna keep it fairly simple over there, and but on the Maxwell's House show we dig in deep. <laughs> yes, we do. And you can email the deep ray at ray at twit.tv if you've got a question or a comment or a suggestion. Ray uh, does this show every uh, Thursday, 2 o'clock Pacific, 5 p.m. Eastern at live.twit.tv. So we encourage you to watch live. And, of course, you can subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or Zoom or just go to uh, uh, twit.tv slash mh for all of the uh, subscription links and downloads. Thanks, Ray. Thank you, Leo. We'll see you next time on Maxwell's right. House. Bye-bye.